Hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Frank Dupre, and I'm talking about living in the last days. Okay, there's a lot of things going on. The Bible tells us in Luke that Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, if we can go back in time to the days of Noah and beforehand, when the earth was good and then it got corrupted and see what it was like, that's what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. So it's really important. So tonight we're going to go into the story of the prodigal son and get a bigger picture of the meaning of the prodigal son. And then we're going to go to the book of Jasher, the book of Enoch, and the Bible. And we're going to see some things about these books and what they have in common with things that took place back in the days of Noah and afterwards too. So let's go right to it, okay? We're going to talk about the prodigal son tonight. So let's go right to the scripture and take a look at the prodigal son and read that section of the Bible that talks about it. It's in Luke chapter 15 that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. All right, uh, let's see, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to verse 11 to 32, and I may jump in here a little bit and not read the exact scriptures, but that's where it's at, Luke chapter 11, excuse me, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Now, Jesus said, he spoke about a parable. He said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the, my share of the property that's coming to me. And in other words, when, when you die, I'm going to get an inheritance. It's not as much as my big brother, but I'm going to get my inheritance. And I want it now. I don't want to wait. I, 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 I don't want to, you know, take my time and wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. So he divided it between them. He didn't fight with them. He didn't argue with him. He didn't tell them, no, that's not good for you. You're going to make mistakes. You're too young for this. He just did it. And that was it. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he spent everything, a severe famine broke out in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed his pigs. Now, there's nothing more abhorrent to a Jewish person than to have to go and feed the pigs. They're swine. They're unclean. You cannot eat them. You can't associate with them. They had nothing to do with them. I mean, if, they, if the guy sent him to feed the sheep, that'd be a different story. But he sent him to feed the pigs. He was in the worst possible condition you can imagine. Amen? All right. And guys, uh, while I'm going through this tonight, if you have a comment or a thought, please share it with me. Okay, you guys? All right. So he's feeding the pigs, and he was longing to fill his belly with the corn that was there for them. He wanted to eat even the corn cobs, something, because he was so hungry. And then he came to his senses. Something happened. He said, I will rise up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And while he was, uh, oh, he said, and treat me like a hired servant. I, I don't deserve to be treated like a son, but treat me like a servant. And so he got up and went. And while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and ran to meet him. Talk about love and talk about faith and talk about patience. You have it in the Father. He has vision. He has faith. He has patience. He's waiting. He knows his son has made mistakes. He knows his son has squandered his living. He knows his son is doing horrible things. But he believes he'll come back because he's been watching and waiting for that, for that road to see his son come down that road one day. And he saw him and ran to meet him. And, and he fell on his face and he said, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Treat me like a servant and all that. And the father said, no, bring the best robe and put it upon him. Put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and let's kill it and celebrate because my son was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they began to celebrate. Now the older son, the older brother was in the fields. And when he came, he heard all the ceremony and the celebration and he was wondering what's going on. And as he heard the music and the dancing, he called to one of the servants and said, Come here, what's going on at the house? And the servant said, Your brother has come back, and your father has killed the fatted calf, and he has received him back safe and sound, and he's so happy. 
So he was angry and he refused to go in. And his father came out to entreat him. And he said to him, come and celebrate. He said, look, father, I've served you these many years. I never disobeyed your commandments. I did all these things. You never gave me anything that I could celebrate with my friends. And his father said to him, son, everything I have is yours. But this is your brother. And he was lost and he's found. He was dead. Now he's alive. So come. It is fitting that we celebrate and be glad. So I want to ask you guys, if anybody can tell me, who do you think Jesus is talking about? All right. Take a moment. Let's hit the text, uh, the, the chat here. Who is Jesus talking about? Who's the elder brother? Who's the son? Who's the father in the story? What's going on? Come on, hit, hit it up real quick. Type it up. Let's get it in there real quick. And let's, let's see what's happening. Come on, somebody tell me. Who is the father? Who is the son? Who's the elder son? Who's the prodigal? Okay, I know you guys know some of these things, all right? I really, really want to uh, see what you've got and what you're doing, uh, okay? So let's do that, all right? And while, you're, while you guys are starting to type and, and do that, let's see if we can go find out a little bit about this prodigal and uh, take a look at him. Okay, I think I have a picture of him here. I'm not sure. Yeah, here he is. Okay, I'm going to put the prodigal up for you guys. That's not the prodigal. Okay, here he comes. There's the prodigal son with the father. I lost him. Here he is. Prodigal son with the father. And while I got this up on here, if you've got any thoughts about who the son is, you know, who is the older son? Who's the younger son? Who's the prodigal? And it's a tremendously touching story. So uh, let's see. I, I just want to see if we're, if I've got you guys going on here. What's happening? All right. Okay. Who is the father? Who is the prodigal? I'm just wondering if I've got if I've lost uh, contact with you guys or something. I don't seem to be oh, having much. All right, I think I'm on. Okay. Anybody got an answer? Anybody have a thought about this? Who the prodigal is? Who's the who's the elder brother? You know, most people. Let me share this with you. Most people will think that, of course, the prodigal son is Christianity. It's the Gentiles. You see, uh, the elder brother would be Israel in one way of looking at this. That uh, the elder brother who uh, has always been there, always been ready to uh, uh, serve God and all that stuff like that. He's the, that's the elder brother. That's Israel. That's the nation of Israel. And the younger son, that's the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles have come to Christ. They've come to Jesus, and they've repented of their sins. They're the ones with the pigs. They're the ones with the unclean things. But now they've repented and come back and said, we're not worthy to be your sons. Treat us like a servant. But he elevates them and says, no, you shall be just like my other son, you are a son to me. And that's how God treats the Gentiles. He says there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, but all are one in Christ Jesus. So can you see that, guys? Uh, so we got a couple of people. Diane says we are the prodigal. Nikki is saying Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Uh, good thoughts, good questions, good things there. But what do you think about what I'm saying? Uh, can you see that the Israelites, that's the elder son, and they were jealous of the Gentiles coming to Christ. They, they really were upset that they were coming to Jesus and getting saved, and that the sinners were coming to Jesus. So that's really, really a, a good way of looking at this. But let's, let's look at, at another level of this story, this story of the prodigal, and let's go back way beyond Israel and the Gentiles. And let's go back into the, the bigger picture of life. Because, you know, life is not really all about just us here in this planet. It's not just about Jewish people, Christian people, non-Christian people. It's, there's much more to our life than that. Amen? So, here's what I want to share with you tonight. Okay? We have a picture of the sons of God who were created first. Okay? Commonly, we call them angels. And the sons of God, some of them were faithful to God all the time. They're still faithful to God. Some rebelled against God, and they went their way. And then God, at another time, creates humankind, creates mankind. And mankind ends up totally depraved, totally in the, in the pigsty, 
and Jesus comes to bring forgiveness. And the elder brother is Satan and the fallen angels, the fallen sons of God. That's the elder brother. The younger brother are humans who received Jesus Christ as their Savior, and now they are called to become more than the children of God, but they are to become the sons of God. And, 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 and something the Bible tells us is that we have this tremendous honor that we have been saved and we are called to be the sons of God. We're to grow up in God, grow up in Christ, and become the sons of God. And Satan, who was a son of God, and the fallen ones who were sons of God. The Bible says how the sons of God met with God, and, and uh, the sons of God took the daughters of men. We're talking about this angelic race, the race before humankind, the elder race. You can call them that. They're the elder race. And there are some there that are so angry and so hateful and so, so filled with disgust that God would take earth because they're celestial beings and that he would take of the earth and make a new creation and turn that creation into the sons of God. So this is a part of the plot and the plan that's going on now is that Satan and the fallen ones hate humans, especially those who receive Jesus Christ as Savior and are now called to become sons of God. Beloved, the Bible says we don't know and we don't see what we are to be right now, but one day we will see that and we will be the sons of God. So we have to understand that. Sons of God is a tremendous term. It means that God is our Father. So we have to understand something. If you, if you go back in the genealogy in Matthew and in Luke, and you look at the genealogy, it goes, uh, in Matthew it goes one way, in Luke it goes another way, but it goes back to the same thing, and it goes back to Adam, who was the son of God. You see, Adam is a direct creation of God. What is the spiritual life inside of Adam? It's the breath of God. That makes him a son of God of God, a human son of God, as opposed to a celestial son of God, the elder race. We need to start to think of angels differently than what we normally think of them as, okay? And I don't think uh, Diane's saying she's never seen that interpretation of the story, never considered it, and, I, and I'll guarantee you that I've never heard it before. I've never heard anybody talk about it that way, but I want to tell you something. This is the bigger picture of what's going on in the universe. See, on the earth, we're concerned with, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles and the Jews becoming this and the Gentiles getting saved and now they're the younger son coming back to God. And that's all true, but there's a bigger picture. Something much, much bigger is involved here. And the elder race, some of the elder race are incest at what God has done. Some of the elder race are celebrating. They've come in. They're celebrating. The good angels that have, that have stuck with God all this while, they're happy. They're celebrating. We have younger brothers. We have brothers of the earth, and they're going to be changed one day. In the twinkling of an eye, they will put off that mortality, put off that humanness, and they will put on the divinity, the immortality that we have also, and they rejoice in that. The Bible says that the angels rejoice every time someone becomes a child of God. Amen? So they're not the elder brother. They're, they're different than that elder brother in the prodigal story. They are those who are faithful. So we, we see the picture that way. We see it that way. So I want to go into a little bit about what's happening here today. Let's take a look at a verse. I'm going to put this in your chat. And for those of you who are following this on YouTube, you know, you're not seeing the chat. And you're not seeing what people are putting in here because this is a live stream going on and we are reproducing this on YouTube. Luke 17, 26 as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. This is, this is probably one of the most tremendous scriptures in the Bible because it talks about how it's going to be on earth when Jesus returns. And that's what really matters to us. I mean, things that happened eons ago, things that happened way, way, way in the past, you know, some people say there used to be a, a land called Atlantis. Some say there were this. All those things are tremendous, but they have nothing to be compared with what I'm talking about right here is that when Jesus returns, the earth is going to be in the same condition that it was in in the days of Noah. And remember, 
the days of Noah, talking about the days of Noah, it's not just when Noah was building the ark for that 120 years. It's actually 1,200 years from Jared, one of his great-great-grandfathers, up until Noah, that the sons of God, the fallen ones, came to the earth, took the daughters of men, had children who were called Nephilim, giants, and they ruled the earth for 1,200 years, and they corrupted mankind. They not only corrupted mankind, they corrupted the animal kingdom, and they provoked God, and that's why God then flooded the earth and started over with Noah and his family and recreated or redesigned, uh, in a sense, the human race all over again, started the human race all over again from one man and one woman and their sons, okay? It's funny how uh, Adam and Eve had three sons, Cain killed Abel, and then they had Seth, and uh, Noah and his wife had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham becomes the one who goes off and begins to have the, uh, uh, the evil lineage comes through him. Cursed be Canaan because of Ham. And the whole lineage of Ham and Canaan and Cush and the others is cursed because they have totally rebelled against God. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit of this stuff here. I want to talk about some of the things that were in the days of Noah. All right. First thing we're going to do is going to take a look at something here that most of the time we don't think about, we don't recognize and see. I want to ask you a question. I'm sorry I kept that picture up for so long. That was a mistake. I really apologize for that. I forgot that I had not taken it down. Sometimes I get caught up with all these things. Is this the angel Gabriel? Uh, you know, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Hail Mary, you are full of grace and you're going to have the child that is the Christ. Is this the angel Gabriel? You know? Or let me, let me ask you a question. Is this the angel Gabriel? Is this the angel Gabriel? Is this an angel? You know, warring angel, tremendous sword, mighty wings, and all that stuff like that. Is this really what angels look like? Is that what they are? Is that who they are? You know something? Uh, I'm not so sure. Can, you, can, we, can we take a look at some other things and get an idea and a feeling for this? Uh, let's take a look at this for a second, okay? If I can get this up here. Here's a, here's a picture of a shining one. This is the picture of someone who is shining. Clothing is shining. It looks shining. And, and sometimes in the Bible we see that an angel appeared and it says, and a man appeared to me and he was shining. His garments were shining and all these things like that. So sometimes we have to start to look at and see, do angels have wings? Well, seraphim and cherubim have wings, but we don't usually see them talking to men. In fact, the cherubim and the seraphim have more to do with the throne of God and the, the, uh, the heavenly kingdom of God than the earthly realm of men. When God sends an angel or a messenger here to the earth, they normally look just like us, okay? Here's another picture for you to take a look at to see about, you know, angels and God and whatnot. Now, this is supposed to be God the Father appearing to Abraham, who is in red there with his head bowed down, and the two on the sides are angels, and you can see the wings on one of them. So they're trying to depict that God is with two angels talking to Abram. Now, you see on the table, there's food, there's drink, and these three entities, God and two angels, had a meal with Abraham. And that's what the Bible tells us, that God came and visited Abraham, and two angels were with him. The very next chapter in the book of Genesis says that God sent the two men to go to Lot in Sodom. And then they destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plains. But they were men. In other words, they looked just like us. They did not look different. They had, yes, they had, sometimes they appear, and they seem to have shining garments, they look like this. They look just like another man, and but they have shining garments, and that's what they're looking like. And we have to understand that God is, that, that, well, let me say it this way, that angels are totally misunderstood. You see, angels, the sons of God, are not like the cherubim. The cherubim, these are incredible beings, all right? The cherubim have the face of a man. They have the face of a lion the face of an ox, 
and in the back they have the face of an eagle. They have four faces, or four, actually it's like four heads on a body, and they have wings, and they fly. And they are always seen when God appears, God the Father appears in the Old Testament, and they're seen. Ezekiel sees them, and he sees them on their flaming, fiery chariots, okay? What other word could he use? UFO, jet plane, he has no word to describe a flying thing, but it's a chariot that's flying. It's a chariot that has fire on it. Instead of a horse, it's got fire, and things like that. And so uh, even our cars, we still call, we still talk about horsepower in our cars. It's got 358 horsepower, you know, or something like that. So anyway, uh, God appears to Abraham with two angels. They look just like men. And the other thing is this. The four of them sit down and have a meal together. They eat and they drink together. So people think that angels are spirit. They don't have a body. You know, they're wisps. They're ghosts, kind of. No, they appear to look like us, and they can eat and drink just like us too. So we need to start to change the way we think about angels and the things of God like that, okay? Now, we're going to go a little deeper into some of this stuff, and I hope that you guys can follow along with me. I want to go into a book that is not a book of the Bible, but it's a book that's mentioned in the Bible. It's the book of Jasher. So, the book of Jasher is not what we call canonical. It's not in the canon of the Bible. In other words, there are 66 books that we believe and accept as the uh, Bible. Uh, Roman Catholic Bible has a few other books. They call them canonical. The Jewish people had their canon, which is what the Old Testament that we call the Old Testament is. It's the same Jewish canon. And they had other books that were inspired, some were historical, but they were things that they looked to and many times uh, quoted them and talked about them. So let's look at the book of Jasher in the Bible, okay? And I'll give you the first scripture so that you guys have this for yourselves over here, okay? Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. All right. Now, um, I'm going to jump back for a second because Rachel's asking a question, and I'm going to put this picture back up here for a second also, okay? This warring angel, okay? Now, the, quest the, the thing that I'm questioning is not that an angel fights or does battle because she says, how did, how did Gabriel fight with the prince of Persia and the prince of Beast, priest, uh, Greece? And these, when it says prince of Persia, it's talking about the principality of Persia or the, the, the fallen angel who was the prince or ruler over Persia. Remember, Satan is the king, the god of this world, and the principalities are his princes. They're the ones who rule underneath him, just like a prince rules underneath his father, okay? So that's what they're like, okay? So, uh, Rachel, that's how we explain that. When I'm just talking about the wings. I'm talking about what they look like. Uh, how do they do battle? We really don't know. There are some things that we could talk about, about angelic fighting, and angelic battles, which one day I'm going to talk about. Uh, and some of this stuff is actually seen in other ancient texts about how there were the gods in the earth, and they have had flying machines, and they had weapons that could blow up an entire city. They had arrows that, you, that they would shoot, and when it hit a city, it would blow up the entire city. We're kind of talking about um, pre-human beings, angels, or the elder race, and when they had a war, there were nuclear bombs and things like that, okay? So we're going to stick with this right now. Let me get my, my screens back up so I can see what uh, I'm talking about here. There's so many things that I'm doing, and uh, makes it hard sometimes to work with this. Okay, so Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, it says, The sun stood still. Now, you know the story about how the sun stood still during a battle that Joshua had against one of the enemies in Canaan. And the moon stayed still, and the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher, that the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not go down for a whole day? You see, where's the history? What, what Moses is saying, because Moses 
you know, is writing, well, not, Moses didn't write the book of Joshua, excuse me, Joshua writing in the book of Joshua and whoever the historians were finishing out the book of Joshua, they said that the book of Jasher reminds us of this. The book of Jasher tells us of this. It's not written in the book of Jasher. Another place, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Let me put that in here so you guys can take a look at this and you can look it up. And remember, the chat goes away once we're finished with the live stream. So if you want to look up things, you've got to do it while it's up live, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. It says, And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. When Saul and Jonathan died in the battle, David lamented, crying out and making a psalm up, saying, How hath the mighty fallen? And it says, David lamented over Saul and Jonathan, his son, and he bade them to teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So the book of Jasher is a historical book, okay? First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, these are what we call historical books in the Bible. They're in the canon. They've been accepted as inspired by God. Well, the inspired by God books mention another book that is historical, and that's the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher records when the sun stood still. The book of Jasher records how the children of Judah were taught the use of the bow and how David lamented over Jonathan and Saul, uh, and that happens there. Now, here's another one, because that's Old Testament, but here's a New Testament one, and it's not as clear, but there's a, a, a Dr. Ken Johnson, a tremendous scholar of the New Testament, uh, has written many, many different books, great theologian. I, I, I listen to a lot of his stuff because he's so good. In 2 Timothy 3.8, it says this, okay? And this is, I'm just going to put this up because you guys, sometimes you need to know about who the good authors are and who you should follow and read. And I'm going to write his name in here, uh, Dr. Ken Johnson, okay? Tremendous stuff. He writes about the Essenes. He writes about the Dead. He's a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar. So he really knows about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now he says that 2 Timothy 3.8, which says this, uh, it talks about how in the days of Moses, how Jane, James and John Brace withstood Moses and they resist the truth. They have corrupt minds and they're reprobate concerning the faith. What he's saying is, Ken Johnson says, that's kind of a quote from the book of Jasher. Okay, so he's saying that the book of Jasher is mentioned twice in the Old Testament and it's quoted in the New Testament, but it's not mentioned as a quote, but it is there. And if you know it, you'd recognize it. So, let's look at a story from the book of Jasher, accepted as a historical book by the writers of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, okay? Jasher chapter 36, verse, verses 29, I'll put this over here, to 32. And I mention this because, again, we're looking at Luke. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. If we can see what it's like back then, we can understand where we're going today, okay? Here it is. Here's the story. A couple of verses. The sons of Shobal were Alvin, Manahan, Ebal, Shepo, Onan, and the sons of Zibion were Aja and Ana. And this was that Ana who founded Yemen in the wilderness when he fed the asses of Zibon, his father. Now, uh, while he was feeding... Now, let's not get into the names and how to pronounce them and things like that. While he was feeding his father's asses, he led them to the wilderness at different times to feed them. So they would go into the different places to feed these donkeys, okay? And there was a day that he brought them to one of the desert places along the seashore opposite the wilderness of the people. And while he was feeding them, behold, a very heavy storm came up from the other side of the sea, and it rested on the asses while they were feeding there, and they all stood still. So in other words, a great wind came up, and instead of them continuing to eat, they just stopped and they waited because this, this storm was brewing on top of them. And then it says this, And then about 120 great and terrible animals came out of the wilderness on the other side of the sea. And they all came to the place where the asses were, and they stood there. And those animals, these great animals, and terrible animals, this is what they were like. From their waist downward, they had the shape of men. But from the waist up, they looked like bears. They had the, uh, the likeness of a bear. 
Some of them had the likeness of the kephas. We don't know what a kephah looks like. It's a lost uh, word. And they had tails coming out of their back between their shoulders, and their tails reached the earth. Now, one of these animals came and struck this man while he was there watching what was going on. And all of the 120 went and jumped on these donkeys, these asses, and took them away and rode them away. Now, when he went, Aina went back, and he fled, and he went to find his father and his brothers, and he told them the story, and from that day forward, they never went near that wilderness again. He's talking about hybrids. He's talking about hybrids who were part animal and part human, okay? Now, some people say these are nothing but stories. They're not real. They can't happen, and that's okay. Let them think what they want to think, uh, but just give me the space to think what I want to think, and I'm going to show you why I believe some of these things, because I believe that some of these things go way, way back, back to the days of Noah also. Now, in the book of Jasher, it mentions somebody called a satyr, and that is also mentioned in the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch, and I don't have the quote here, but the book of Enoch is also mentioned in the Bible, and in reality, much of the book of Enoch is literally quoted in the Bible by Peter. Jesus actually quotes a number of things in the book of Enoch, and a guy like Dr. Ken Johnson, he brings these things out as he puts the two books side by side, and he shows you where Jesus says something, and it's the same thing that's said in the book of Enoch, where Peter says something, and it's the same thing in the book of Enoch. So Enoch, the book of Enoch, was accepted by the Jewish people of, his, of the day of Jesus as a book that you could quote and believe in. The book of Enoch says this in chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Let me put this over here. Fallen angels then and fallen angels now. Exactly, Andy. Fallen angels were back then and fallen angels are here now. They're still around. They haven't gone away. And they're going to be around for a long time. Uh, Diane says, I believe every fable and myth has at least some basis in fact. That's the definition of a myth. A myth is a story that has truth at the root. And so, that, number one, there's truth in the root of all these myths. Okay, And for some of us, we don't believe they're myths. We believe they're actually legends. Okay, so now the book of Enoch says this, and then he, uh, Enoch is talking about Uriel, who was a great angel of God, a good one, and he said, the uh, angel said, now, the angels that cohabited with women, being numerous in their appearance, they made men profane. They caused them to sin, so that they sacrificed to devils as to gods. And in other words, they considered the devils gods, okay? Now, the thing about it is this. He says that there's a great judgment day coming, and they will all be consumed. It's talking about the fallen angels, and it does. It, it tells us that in the Bible. Psalm 82 tells us there's a great judgment coming, and they're going to die like men. So there's going to be a tremendous judgment upon those fallen ones and upon Satan and others, okay? But this is what it says. It says, they sacrificed to devils, as if they were gods. And that word devils in the book of Enoch is the same word, satar, S-A-Y-T-R-S, okay? I'm going to just put that in here, satar, so you see what I'm saying, okay? This is a satar, book of Enoch, okay? They sacrificed to satars as if they were men. Well, does the Bible mention satars also? Yes, it does. The Bible mentions satars right here in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 14. It says this, The wild beasts of the desert shall meet with the wild beasts of the islands, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. In other words, the satyrs will cry or speak to one another. And the screech owl shall also rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Now, a satyr, and I'm going to tell you what a satyr is, a satyr is a half man, half goat. Those of you, have you ever seen the god Pan? The god Pan is a goat from the waist down and a man from the waist up. Okay? That's Pan. And that's what a satyr is. A satyr is a half goat, half man. The Bible says that the satyrs are there in the wilderness and they will be with other wild beasts 
And so he's not just talking about like a lion or a tiger or a bear. He's talking about wild beasts, meaning hybrids, things that are not normal, okay? And the satyr will cry to his fellow, other satyrs. So there were, what Enoch says are devils. In Isaiah, he says these are devils, they are satyrs. Let's look at one more scripture, okay, just to give you another place, because the Bible says we should have everything in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So here, Second Chronicles 11, verse 14 and 15. The Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them out of executing the priest's office. When the split came in Israel, David dies, Solomon dies, the, the kingdom is now split. Rehoboam becomes the king. Jeroboam splits the kingdom and starts the northern kingdom of Israel, while Rehoboam leads the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. So he says, it says here in Chronicles, that Jeroboam and his sons cast out all the priests from executing the priest's office, so they went to Judah. They went to Jerusalem. And it says this, And he ordained himself, he ordained for himself, Jeroboam, ordained priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. Now, most people, if they remember the scriptures, they'll remember that Jeroboam set up two calves in, uh, in northern Israel because he said, if we don't do something, they'll all go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want them going to Jerusalem, so we're going to do something. He set up the golden calves in the northern kingdom, in Samaria, actually. But he also did something else. He had them worship and do sacrifices to devils. And that word devils in verse 15 is satars. He had them worship the satars, the half-goat, half-human hybrids that are mentioned in Jasher, Enoch, and the Bible. This is what was going on. The book of Jasher tells us and I'm going to just add you this one here, and we're getting running a little bit longer today, but that's okay. In Jasher 4, 18, it says this, And the judges and the rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. The judges and the rulers are the fallen ones, the fallen angels. And even the sons of men in those days took of the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and they taught the mixture of one species with another, okay, one species with another, and what they did was, oops, sorry about that, we're not at the end of the night, hit the wrong guy, all right, they made hybrids, this is a hybrid, it's a falcon or eagle's head on a body of a man, it has the wings and the head of a bird and the body of a man, the Egyptians worshipped these, the Greeks worshipped these, the Hindus worship these. They're all over the Old Testament. And what happened in these days also is that there were what we call mighty men or Geborim. Uh, Nimrod, king of Babylon, was a mighty man, a Geborim. This is a giant. He has a lion in his arm. A lion, if you've ever seen a lion face to face or in a cage or in a, in a zoo, you know they're not little. They're not like cats and dogs. This is what a Geborim was. It was a mighty man. It was a giant. The Bible tells us that Nimrod became a Geborim. Something happened to Nimrod to make him a giant. He went from being a regular man to becoming a giant. How did that happen? It happened because of the mixing of DNA. The mixing of the, uh, the human DNA with fallen angel DNA, and they also mingled and mixed different beasts. Here's a picture of a satyr. This is actually an ancient Greek statue. Mix, uh, talk about the goat, the body of a goat on the bottom, and a man on the top. And next to him, I have Lilith. Now, Lilith, in Isaiah 34, it talks about, uh, it says, Isaiah 34, and the screech owl shall also rest there and find for herself a place of rest. That screech owl is translated, that's the word Lilith, translated into screech owl. And if you notice who is near Lilith, but owls are there, okay? And look at her feet. 
Feet of a bird, wings of a bird, body of a woman. This is a hybrid. It's a female hybrid. And she is the oldest female demonic entity that we have in the history of the earth. Lilith is the first female demon or goddess and mentioned in worshiping by the, by the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians back then. And she's mentioned in the Bible. It translates Lilith as screech owl. Now, why do they translate things this way? Why didn't they just leave the word satars in instead of devils? I don't know. The translators sometimes can't, couldn't handle the truth. It just reminds me of, of uh, that movie where Tom Cruise is a lawyer with another woman, and, uh, and he says to, to uh, the guy in charge, he says, we just want the truth. And the guy says, you can't handle the truth. And that's what happened to the translators. They could not handle the truth. They just couldn't do it. Couldn't handle it. All right. So why am I saying all these things? I'm saying these things because today we have transhumanism. We have the mixture of computers with people. We've got chips in the hands. We've got chips going to go in the head. We've got uh, computer stuff on your skin that you can read your bodily things and it's, and it's merging and, and technology is getting into this. We have literally going on, and this is no joke, there have been over 150 hybrids of animals and people created in laboratories in China and in other places in what they call black laboratories. And they're experimenting with these things. I don't know if you've seen it. I didn't put it up today. But there's a picture, and this is back from almost 30 years ago, at least 25 years ago in the mid-90s. There was a some scientists who, in trying to figure ways of helping people who have lost limbs and things like that. How can we grow them? They grew an ear inside of a mouse. Okay. Now, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, I think I can do this and get this for you real quick because, again, I'm going late, so I might as well go a little bit later. I know I have it here somewhere, so just give me a moment to get it. Uh, the mouse with the ear. Where do I have the mouse with the ear? Where is he? Where is that guy? The mouse with the ear. M-O-U... Uh, I don't know if I have them in here. Anyway, I'll find them, and I'll show them to you guys in a second, if I can. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. No, I don't have it. I don't have it here. I'm sorry, guys. I don't have it for you. I'll have to do it another time. I'll throw it up another time. The mouse with the ear. This is incredible, and... Uh, that's what they're doing. They're growing things. They're using. They're growing human limbs with pigs. And this is literally being done in laboratories today. They're having human limbs being grown with a pig. They're putting pig stuff into humans and growing things. They're putting. They put a pig heart into a human being. There, there's a mingling and a mixing through technology. Back in the days of Noah, it was done through the mixing and mingling of DNA. They're getting there now. They're splitting DNA. They're doing things like that, and they're putting these things together. And we're headed into a time where, like uh, Jasher says, they were terrible. They were great and terrible, uh, horrible beings. They, they were the, the body of a man underneath and a bear on the top. And they got on the donkeys and rode away with them. And this is the stuff that happened. The mythology stuff, it's coming back. Because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, Another question, go back to the beginning. Do angels have wings? Yes, seraphim and cherubim have wings. Seraphim have six wings. They're in the throne room of God. They sing out and cry out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. When Isaiah was taken up into the throne room of God, a seraphim went and got a burning coal. The word seraph means burning. And so a seraphim got a burning coal, touched Isaiah's lips and said, now you're clean. And, and, and God said, who shall I send? Isaiah said, uh, send me. Of course, we've seen that in the Bible. So seraphim have six wings, and they're in the throne room of God. Cherubim have four faces and four wings, and they accompany God. Cherubim are guardians of the throne. These are awesome guardians of the throne. Four faces they see in every direction. So they see everything going around, okay? So, but the messengers that God sends to the earth, the elder brother, they look like us. In fact, what we should say is, we look like them. And I'm going to go back to one scripture. 
in the beginning, in Genesis, when we see the creation of man, what we see is God says, and the Lord God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who's the us? Okay? If you know, tell me who is the us. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. You know, Rachel and Diane, you guys have seen these things. You've seen stuff, the, the, the ear on the pig, the ear on the mouse, and all that stuff. But who is the us in Genesis when God says, let us make man? It's not the Trinity. You know, people think it's the Trinity. It's not the Trinity. You know, there was, there's no conception of the Trinity in the book of Genesis. It is God. God is what? I am the Lord God. The Lord thy God is one God. Now, it's funny thing about the, the word one. The, the word one is a word for composite being. In other words, he is God. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit inside. But when he says, let us make man, he's talking to the elder brothers, the sons of God. And he's saying to them, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so the elder, some of the elder brothers, the ones who were faithful, God's counsel, God speaks and says, let us make man in our image. We're going to make a younger brother of the earth. One day we'll make them of the heavens like you. But right now we have to do something because you have brothers who have fallen, who have sinned, who have gone away, gone astray, gone their own way. And they've rebelled and they're trying to destroy everything we're doing. We're going to do something that is going to make them burn on the inside. We're going to take and make of the earth sons of God, younger brothers who are one day going to rise up and become like us. What does Satan say to Eve? Eat of this, because don't you know that when you eat of it, you become like gods? You'll become like me? You'll become like us? I don't know what's going on, but somebody's printing over here. But you'll become like us. That's the lie. The lie that so many believe is that humankind is divine. There's a divine spark. We all have God on the inside. We just have to realize that and we'll be like the gods. That's the lie of the devil. The truth is, humankind is made of the earth. It's broken. It's clay. It is not divine. But God breathed into it and made them sons of God. And they have fallen down, fallen away, gone their own way. But we're coming back and he's receiving us, and he's saying, come, let us celebrate together. Amen? I hope you guys have enjoyed a little bit uh, about what we're talking about tonight. And uh, Andy says he got a question about the us. Well, I think we're going to have to put that off till next week, but let's remind me at the beginning of next week. In fact, I'll make a note of it, and we'll start off with the us in that next week. Okay, guys? So until next week, let's... Keep the faith and let the Holy Spirit be with us, bringing us truth and light and bringing us wisdom and love.